This is a conversation and Q&A with Zach Stein. Zach is a philosopher of education who coined the term a time between worlds. The broader sense that the time between worlds was like catalyzed, that there was a sense that everyone became aware of the, um, the liminality of the position of the human. Um, and I think that uh, continues. He's also a co-founder of the Consilience Project with Daniel Schmachtenberger, which is aimed at improving the information landscape and of sparking a cultural renaissance. Zach's a really interesting guy, and this was a great conversation, so I hope you enjoy it. So, Zach, I want to start with that concept of a time between worlds, because implicit in that is the idea that we're moving from one world, and I think a lot of people have talked about that, the kind of sense of civilizational collapse or certainly the end of a, of, a, of a way of being that many of the people in Rebel Wisdom have spoken to, but also there's a suggestion there that there is a destination. Do you have a sense of what that destination is? Hmm. Uh, in specific, no. In specific, no. And there is, in when you're in the position of being you know, between worlds, uh, which you say is poetic, but it's actually basically a sociological construct <laughs> that I took from Emmanuel Wallerstein. It's a very specific techno-economic position. We're between the basic structures of institutions. <clears throat> and uh, so in a sense that we're in that uh, kind of hard fork or catastrophic bifurcation of a complex dynamical system situation where there's a destination. <laughs> it's either higher order coherence or lower order recoherence, which in this case probably isn't possible given the existence of nuclear reactors and, and uh, other things. So, so yeah, we're looking for a way through the eye of the needle towards some kind of more complex, more coherent way of getting humans to cooperate at scale. And my concern being getting humans to educate at scale, getting humans to actually transform capacity, their own internal capacity, not technological capacity, which is important. We need to figure out how to do all of that stuff. <laughs> but in order to do that, the prerequisite is actually getting our skills in order, getting our mindsets and emotional dispositions and those kinds of things in order. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, one of the aspects of the destination is something like a, uh, a new personhood, a new kind of personhood, a new basic set of citizen capacities, if you will. And your focus is primarily on education. Would you say that it's primarily an educational crisis or is, do you feel that that's just your particular piece to hold? Uh, if you define education the way I define it, which is, much more broadly than just schools, uh, then I think you could you could make the argument that, in a sense, the the crisis that contains all of the other smaller crises. <laughs> this is one way of thinking about the meta crisis. That crisis that contains all of the other crises is something like a crisis of the human mind. It's a crisis of our ability to grapple and hold the situation, and then to change our capacities and orientation <clears throat> to the situation. Um, so when you think about uh, deep adaptation, um, it is both technological and psychological. And I believe psychology is maybe the primary mover here. So in that sense, broadly construed, <laughs> it is fundamentally an educational crisis. Uh, there are crises in the schools, but I define education as the, that whole process of intergenerational transmission, which can be fundamentally disrupted and a catastrophic bifurcation of intergenerational transmission is a civilizational collapse vector, if you will. Um, it's one of the things that happens when civilization collapses no matter what, but it also can happen as one of the things that kind of causes it <laughs> to more rapidly occur. The uh, abrupt and profound loss of skill uh, and capacity and emotional disposition and those things. Mm. And you've, I've heard you describe it as a loss of teacherly authority. Does that, is that the core of it, would you say? Uh, it, it's one way to think about the core of it. It's one of the things that is 
essential to amend as part of any resolution. Um, the, the kind of, uh, the, uh, the diagnostic, if you will, does, it, it expands beyond just the collapse of teacherly authority. That is something that characterizes our situation, but we're looking at a, a multi-institutional educational crisis essentially. Um, and, uh, so yeah, the collapse of teacherly authority, which is to say the absence of those contexts in which, um, you can exercise that holistic intergenerational transmission, right? Um, that is a key node. So it's good that you identified that. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. so in, in some sense, that is the core of it. And how did we get here? How did we get here? That's the broader question, right? Yeah. If the problem, I mean, the collapse of teacherly authority, I think, is a. when I first heard you say that, it made a lot of sense and it was a really helpful frame. Um, but I just wonder if we could unpack that a little bit. Uh, and how have we got there? Is it, is it mostly the impact of technology? Is it a, a bigger shift between kind of like the, 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 the generation gap has now become a chasm in some ways? I mean, what are the, what are the factors that have led to this place mm -hmm. where we're at now, where we sort of feel very adrift? Yeah, it's, it's definitely multi, <laughs> multifactorial, you know. Um, if you like Marshall McLuhan, then you look at something like the basic paradigmatic shifts in communications technologies from print to electric to digital. <clears throat> at each one of those, you had major educational crises, major educational crises. Now, in each one of those up to the digital, which is the one we're in, uh, you had um, educational crises in contexts where you didn't have existential technology which is to say technology that can destroy the whole planet and all the humans on it. <laughs> so it's okay if everyone got confused for 30 or 40 years, like happened at the end of the long 16th century with 30 years war after the printing press finally took hold and the Catholic church invented propaganda and you had this total warfare, including informational warfare, which was an educational crisis. And you could argue as maybe Alexander Bard might that that whole route from the Renaissance to the enlightenment was about dealing with the implications of the printing press. So you could argue similarly, we're in a situation where the digital has disrupted intergenerational transmission and we're in that. So that's one route, but there are other ones, <clears throat> you know, um, the economic, uh, the way economic systems uh, began to superordinately kind of like design educational systems, which I call reductive human capital theory, <laughs> where the educational system becomes a servant to the economy, where the whole point of the school is to fix the economic system. <clears throat> this is another thing, the importing of market models, financializations of education, 1972 creation of the student loan, the corporation in the United States. Uh, these things were part of it, right? Um, I think you also have uh, a factor, which again has been playing out since the end of the long 16th century, the beginning of this, <clears throat> this world that we're leaving. Um, uh, the family, right? The family as a target of colonization and commodification, <laughs> uh, that the family has been disrupted um, first by labor systems uh, and then by communications technologies <clears throat> and now by biomedical technologies, the the medicalization of the family structure uh, and the medicalization of academic underperformance. So there's been kind of some major dynamics in the kind of like basic unit of the family. So what do you mean by the medicalization of family structure there? Um, <clears throat> so it's, uh, it's one of the ways you can think about the family and the things that used to be handled in the context of family uh, as being transferred into uh, kind of bureaucratic management, which also ends up being like a profit extraction center. So like when you're dealing with an ill or sick relative or dying relative, uh, I remember Obama speaking to this once, that you're dealing with insurance paperwork. Like you're having these conversations in the hospital, of course, but you're also dealing with insurance paperwork, dealing with financial strain, dealing with complex systems of authority uh, and medical decision-making, which 
outstrip your capacity to actually resist them. Um, <clears throat> and so it used to be the religious authority showed up and you hung around the bedside and you did what you could and <laughs> the person was sick and died. Uh, and that was held in what Hobbes would call the life world. Um, so as the family system uh, first gets brought into like, okay, now you're regulating your whole day based on the wage labor system. <laughs> and then it gets brought into you're regulating it on the TV <laughs> and uh, the rhythms of what is broadcast and when. Uh, and now it's being even uh, more higher order regulated <laughs> in terms of a whole bunch of dynamics, including this biomedical one. So, um, and again, this is part of what um, our basic institutions are kind of in a sense, sense built to do. They're, they're in a sense benignly carrying out their um, defective generator functions, <laughs> if you will, as Schmachtberger would would put it. So it's not some conspiracy to take over the family. It's about um, building medical systems and insurance systems in a certain way, uh, building broadcast technologies in a certain way, um, eventually building digital technologies like your phone in a certain way, <clears throat> where the screen now runs interference between family conversation in a pretty systematic way. Um, and then what you're reading on the screen uh, is imported uh, into family conversation to disrupt <laughs> uh, what used to be community um, and uh, care. So, so that's a little, that's a little bit of it. So it's multi-institutional generational crisis. Um, then you get things like post postmodern critical theory, uh, the kind of turn towards complexity science uh, and a whole bunch of other factors that also made teacherly authority in particular, very, very, very vexed. And that's part, part of the breakdown of the schools contributed to that because many teachers have teacherly authority by virtue of having bureaucratic authority, <laughs> whereas legitimate teacherly authority is held by virtue of having actual epistemic asymmetry. <laughs> that makes sense. <clears throat> and so to the degree that the schools cease to work, people become critical of the idea of teacherly authority because they mostly encounter it in a bureaucratized context. Uh, and then you get the media, like the New York Times or Fox or whatever, which is also supposed to be holding some teacherly authority, they obviously become problematic. <laughs> so, you're, so everyone's looking around where, who is the person I can trust with the future of my mind? Where can I look for guidance, especially from elders, <clears throat> about the ways of the world, um, both what is legitimate in terms of authority, both what makes sense in terms of the world uh, and what's meaning making. And the meaning crisis is also in part of the cascade of the underlying educational crisis. Uh, so yeah, so the absence of teacherly authority thrown into the mix of that technological disruption of um, family and et cetera, puts us in a pretty dicey spot. Um, uh, which is not a spot of total like incapacitation, but a, a spot of very diverse and stratified capacity and educational opportunity. So we're having people who are smarter than people have ever been, <laughs> like crazy, ridiculously exposed to unprecedented material. Um, kids even talking with NASA scientists in a spaceship and stuff. Like I didn't do that when I was a kid. Uh, but then you also have people uh, in... Uh, saturated with disinformation, with no access to anything like a healthy epistemic commons or good faith argumentation, even when they're in the bureaucracies like schools that are supposed to attend to them uh, in that manner. Yeah. I'd love to, in a second, come to sort of solutions. I know you're involved with the Consilience Project, so that's one, that's one project that's operating in this space. But before, before that, you wrote this uh, essay I think I just checked it out. Is at the end of March last year, so in the kind of early throes of COVID, called a war broke out in heaven, and it was at the time where everything like it, it was a really intense time. And I reread parts of it just before, and you you mention in it um, kind of referring to the horsemen of the apocalypse, the great unpatterning, this sense that I think a lot of us had back then of this real intensity, and maybe a lot of us who've been talking about systems change or some kind of shift um, shift for kind of into new kinds of beings, as you talked about, had this sense that this was it. This was the crisis that was going to accelerate that kind of shift. And I'm really interested now to look back at that and say, did we overplay it? Do, do you think that, do you look back at that essay and 
does it still stand up or do you think that we maybe got caught up in some of this kind of intensity of the moment back then? It's hmm. an interesting question. I actually haven't looked at that essay uh, in a while. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's interesting that there's a sense that the crisis is over, or at least that there's a sense that we want the crisis to be over um, and that there's a turning uh, in the larger narratives towards articulating a sense that the crisis is over. Um, I think my argument was that we were at the be where it's the end of the beginning <laughs> uh, and that we're in a cascading set of compounding crises. Um, so <clears throat> the broader sense that the time between worlds was like catalyzed, that there was a sense that everyone became aware of the um, the liminality of the position of the human. Um, and I think that uh, continues. So I'll, I'll be curious to see, like, I, I think the question is in a sense premature. <laughs> like, uh, you know, I suggested that because of what occurred, uh, there was an opening in the imaginal, uh, which occurs when you're between worlds. When, when you're solidly in a world, basically your imagination kind of works like your your models you throw out are predictive and <laughs> you know the the things you say to others are understood and that like the world is working when the when you're between worlds uh then actually you're forced to expand the imagination so when this thing first hit in march there was a sense of um what would happen it wasn't clear what the paths that would emerge were and so there was a time of totally wide open imagination both towards the good and the bad like the terrible <laughs> and the amazing so that whole thing opened up for a lot of people at the same time and that's so that's the notion of the time between worlds and the notion of the war in heaven is what takes place in people's imaginations everyone's not just us all at all stratas of society all the highest power players are also like whoa opportunity <laughs> uh, and so there's that question of how does the war in heaven resolve itself however that happens we collapse the path out basically downstream from the imaginal um, as a psychologist, this would be one way to think about it. And so insofar as we do to return to something that everyone believes is now crisis averted, <laughs> we've collapsed. We've collapsed back down into something. And uh, the argument was, well, that, that could be for better or for worse. <laughs> and um, so it remains to be seen, I believe to what extent we return to normal <laughs> and to what extent we call normal something that actually it, it was not normal <laughs> two years ago, three years ago. And now we just call it normal crisis averted. <laughs> Imagination collapses. You can project, you can start saving for retirement again. Uh, you can do all of that stuff, which you thought you could do when you thought that you weren't between worlds. Um, but we still are uh, even more intensely. So, um the anyway we there's a bunch of there's a bunch of factors in there but i actually need to reread the essay <laughs> and see uh you know there, those were crazy days no doubt about it um and uh i say more crazy days are coming is my sense yeah yeah i didn't want to put you on the spot defending the the, the wording that you used over a year ago it's more the sense that i think we put out a whole series of films at the time about it being a liminal space. And I, I, I still stand by those films, definitely the sense of COVID as a catalyst of intensity, the sense that we had Eric Davis on, for example, talking about it like a spiritual emergency. And there was this real sense of learning how to operate in a liminal space, not making sense too quickly, all of these kind of skills that really came into focus. And I guess my, this is a really live inquiry for me looking back it is like, did we over, because a lot of us have been like, my, my friend Jules Evans talks, he put a piece out, said, dude, where's my paradigm shift? Because people have been talking about paradigm shift. If you actually look at the, the history of it for, for over a century now, and kind of everyone thinks, oh, it'll happen in my lifetime, or it'll happen kind of in the next short period. And there was certainly the sense during COVID that it was happening, or we were in one of these shifts. And I just wonder how you do you feel that what we got was a kind of prefiguration of something that that is coming with more intensity? And where do you feel that we're at now? As as you say, it does feel like 
things have calmed down, certainly, or there is certainly the illusion of stability now that there maybe wasn't before? I mean, these are good, these are good questions to try to take stock of where we're at, you know, because it's been about a year. Um, and, you know, the sense that there would be an immediate paradigm shift in a way that was perceived as positive <laughs> and in a way that was uh, in the interest of everyone um, was the sense that we were hoping for. Um, you could argue that there have been paradigm shifts in play, which <clears throat> we don't really want to look at very carefully. Like, so for example, the escalating rate of economic inequality, which can be tied directly to the dynamics of the pandemic itself, um, uh, which if you stack them on top of what Piketty already predicted in Capital in the 21st Century, you're looking at something like a very runaway dynamic at the core of the financial infrastructure of the entire uh, world, essentially. So that's borderline quantitative shift that has a quality, quantitative shift so big it has a quality of its own, which looks a little bit like a paradigm shift. You're also looking at the expansion of biomedical infrastructure uh, and the investment in biomedical medical infrastructure at a scale that is remarkably unprecedented, which also has that kind of like quantity adds up to a new kind of quality and you're in a different kind of world where we're discussing uh, things that weren't ever, <laughs> that had been discussed only by a small number of very sophisticated people <laughs> before and are now being argued about around dinner tables, right? Um, so in that sense, I would argue we didn't get the paradigm shift we wanted, but we are in the midst of a paradigm shift. Uh, and uh, there's still play, <laughs> there's still openness, and we're still between worlds, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, the sense that there'd be a, a spiritual awakening, I don't think so. I think we've had um, something more like an escalation of information warfare. <laughs> and uh, deep uh, confusion setting in. Yeah. And if there was a spiritual awakening, it looked as much like QAnon as it looked like any other kind of manifestation of the religious impulse gone crazy. I, and yeah, that's what I'm going to think about. It. I mean, but that's what I meant by like the information warfare. Like it's, uh, you know, you leverage people's needs for creating propaganda if people have a need if people are spiritually alienated <laughs> uh and i'm talking about the left and the right if people are spiritually alienated then you play on that need in order to create a worldview that is attractive and draws them into action even if the action is just continuing to you know watch your videos or <clears throat> take to the streets or something so so yeah there, there was a need in that moment for a re-enlivening of spirit absolutely and this isn't to discount the actual breaking opens <laughs> that happened in community and person, no doubt. Um, and it's not to say that the thing collapsed back. It hasn't collapsed back. <laughs> there's a sense that we desperately wanted to. And there's a, there's, a, there's a continual, you know, shift. There's been a shift in the media since January towards a narrative that it's returning. <laughs> um, but it, it hasn't. And like I said, it very well could return to a form of normal that we would never have called normal before. Just to remind everyone, the if you could put the document in the, uh, thank you, Clay, you've already done that. So if you want to go and have a look at some of the questions, upvote them, we'll be coming to the questions in about 10 minutes or so. Um, the, the other line that really jumped out at me from your essay was that we're shaped by vast and complex forces and becoming different kinds of people. Um, would you like to, to explain what you mean by that? Mm -hmm. I mean, in a sense, this is, this is always true. Um, you know, that uh, one of the most interesting things about postmodernism and one of the most delicate plays that need to be made about what's ever after postmodernism, like metamodernism, is the notion of the self, the individual. Where is it? Where are you? Who are you? <laughs> are you intradermal? Are you within your skin? <laughs> or are you distributed across the social matrix, the matrix of, of media and, and things of that nature? Um, and so in a time between worlds in particular, um, the kind of like state space for possible identity creation becomes vast. Um, and when you're in the dynamic like with the pandemic, and you're getting these types of paradigm shifts I was describing in terms of economic inequality, 
information warfare and things of that nature. Uh, yeah, then personhood is on the line, which is what I was saying about <laughs> the future of what's ever next being a new form of personhood, um, for better or for worse. Um, so uh, that sense of there being existential risk concerning um, just the end of biological organisms' ability to reproduce themselves, there's also the risk that we just become way less human than we need to be to have something like a humane society. Um, and so when you say we're shaped by vast forces, uh, one dynamic is that. The other has always been historically true. I mean, the, the wind, <laughs> right? <laughs> like the storms, uh, uh, spirit. Um, so that statement's very broad. Uh, but what I was specifically referring to there was the, the self-making institutions of our society, which I would call educational institutions. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, those dynamics of, of self-making that are beyond our control, that we're caught up in um, as a kind of part of history. And maybe let's shift to some solutions to the, the problem space that you outlined earlier on. I mentioned the Consilience Project. You're very involved in that with Daniel Schmachtenberger looking at the information ecology. I guess one of the questions is how central do you think that task is, looking at the information ecology? And what are the other um, tasks and solutions that you see as being essential? Yeah. I mean, the Consilience Project is, is trying to diagnose aspects of the information ecology and also articulate a comprehensive social theory that allows that diagnostic to be put in context so people could even think about solutioning. Um, so this conversation we've been having about the educational crisis, I uh, just completed with my colleagues a paper about that for the Consilience Project. That's a core thing to get. <laughs> and so we're, in a sense, working on uh, core social theory, situational assessment, and meta-news analysis in the interest of providing people with capacity to, um, to, re to, re to retain autonomy and sovereignty in the context of what we were just discussing about these large <laughs> person shaping dimensions of our, of our world. Um, and also to think about, as we were also discussing, design parameters for what solutions could even, could even look like. And so we're actually actively recruiting you now postdoc level <laughs> social theorists, biologists, complexity scientists to think and write with us uh, in, that, in that domain. Um, and the meta-news analysis where I've also spent a lot of time is fascinating because that's where you're just doing very, very careful diagnostics of the media landscape itself, where you look at 1700 stories and then focus in on 100 and then do thematic analysis and just show the distribution of where the polarization occurs, how the language gets weaponized, those kinds of dimensions. And the impetus there is actually to spawn a new genre of kind of meta journalism, <laughs> which could begin to call out <laughs> the information warfare dynamics um, and bring people back to something like a good faith for the state. Um, so a kind of higher order meta <laughs> quality control parameter, which isn't fact checking. Fact checking is just an extension of the existing system. <laughs> uh, you need something that's truly operating at a different level with a different methodology. So meta news does that kind of work, um, which is again, the basis of, as I said, the container for all the other crises <laughs> is this educational crisis. And the consilience project is one to play at that dimension of the of the situation so i think it is i think it is actually quite essential um especially in so far as the the basis the basic capacities needed to maintain an open society especially an open society in the context of rapid technological developments in the domain of information technology <laughs> like that's a that's a serious like manhattan project level problem like we, we need to solve that problem or, or we'll have to drop the pretense of having an open society essentially. Um, and so that's the level at which we're trying to do basic theory and intervention into the, into the dynamics of those discussions with the Consilience Project, um, which is a five-year project. And so we're building a core catalytic set of 
tools and theories um, in the interest of trying to galvanize a broader transmedia object and eventually a movement of people who are you know, working to fix the educational crisis specifically. And is, is that where you're putting all of your um, attention at the moment? Or do you have any other projects or what, what do you see as the other work that needs to be done in this space? Totally. Yeah. So, you know, I continue to write um, in collaboration with Ken Wilbur, Mark Gaffney, Barbara Marks Hubbard, uh, may, her, may she rest in peace, uh, and that group of integral thinkers um, working to think about deeper narratives of identity, self, spirit, cosmos, basic metaphysics, what we call cosmorotic humanism, which is a kind of like an attempt to, <clears throat> to, in a sense, take integral theory into the 21st century, if you will. Um, and so that, that work is actually essential too, uh, because we can fix many of the structural problems, uh, even with educational systems and content delivery systems and bad incentives for media distribution and all of that stuff, and still have uh, a spiritual desert, <laughs> like a, a meaning crisis without end. Um, and the resources, uh, as Habermas would say, the semantic resources lay untapped within the religious traditions. And he specifically says that there's the semantic resources of the religious traditions. They provide what we need to protect vulnerable ways of life, which is to say, protect the dinner table, right? To protect the children, to protect the most intimate contexts of intergenerational transmission. Those have always been religious languages. And regardless of what you think of religion, there's all these connotations. I'm not talking about the religion you hate, <laughs> right? I'm talking about the religion that's impossible to embrace. Um, and so something like a, a neo perennialism or an evolving perennialism uh, and something like basic first principles, first values of a new worldview. Um, it's not ours to create, <laughs> but it's ours to begin to build some basic uh, directionality towards it. That the problem isn't just one of like, quote, sense making and solving technical problems. It's a, it's a deeper existential crisis that we're in. Uh, so for example, the just echoing calls to eliminate free will from reasonable society. Like if you're talking about free will, then you can't be reasonably a scientific person, <laughs> right? Like the, the, this is still where we're encountering this. Um, and there's a bunch of other aspects to emerging um, scientific meta narratives, whether they want to call themselves or not, which is just kind of like metaphysics, <laughs> uh, the story about what the universe is, what the human is. Um, uh, the fragmentation of that discourse, the alienation of that discourse, the implicit nihilism often and epistemic hubris of that discourse uh, puts uh, people in a position to not often have a better available narrative. And so, so that work at the, at the level of deep, uh, deep universe storytelling, basically, uh, I'm also continuing to engage in that work. And then I have ongoing writing projects of my own where I'm kind of partnering with Ross in that perspectiva, <clears throat> working in the foundations of philosophy of education, specifically historical work on Johnny Los Caminas, um, and, uh, and historical work related to elaborating uh, my meta psychology, which I articulate on the STOA. So like all of that stuff is, is moving forward kind of simultaneously, but definitely most of my days are spent uh, with the Consilience Project at this point. Yeah, I was struck by rereading that essay that the war broke out in heaven, like how theological your language and your framing was. Um, and, I, and I'm interested if that, if you feel that that's the level of analysis that is required. I believe so, you know. Um, Ken Wilber said something in, I think, The Religion of Tomorrow to the effect of like, in pre-modernity, God was everywhere. Like God was in everything, in every word, in every relationship, for better and for worse. <laughs> right? Uh, in modernity, God is nowhere. <laughs> can be disenchanted, can't find him, even if you're looking for him, and you're laughed at for doing so. Uh, in whatever comes next, God's everywhere again. Uh, but not in a naive way. It's not in a, 
for Wilburites out there, it's a pre-trans fallacy, right? <laughs> uh, in a way that actually can handle all of the objections that modernity can bring to it, all of the reasonable non-pathological objections that modernity can bring to it. And I say this in my book, I say that, you know, as we resolve the educational crisis, if we do, and we re-world, right? We re-worlding, <laughs> if that occurs, the educational systems that can do that that can the educational systems that can contain and re, reproduce a viable future civilization they will need to grapple with the sacred fundamentally um, the language of it uh, and a return to a form of religiosity um, and again not a naive perennialism a neo-evolving perennialism <laughs> and i can talk at length and not a um a kind of like naive good faith uh, but not cynical, but a post-cynical, post-tribal, good faith, a kind of, that this, this form of talk about the sacred becomes essential. Um, and, and it's related actually to this issue of teacherly authority, <laughs> um, which has for long been inseparable from the most sacred dimensions of a culture. And with modernity, we separate church and state, understandably, actually huge innovation. <laughs> Uh, given the coupling of, of religion with power structure uh, and military might and things of that nature. But the removal of teacherly authority from contexts of sacred transmission, if you will, uh, has been long playing out. And Max Weber saw it, and a whole bunch of sociologists saw that this was a dynamic that would eventually undercut <laughs> what we know of as civilization. Um, and uh, so, yeah, the the, uh, the disenchantment of the world um, is one of the things that's being reversed, <laughs> in a sense. And you can see it, again, for better and for worse, even with, and Habermas speaks to this, with the upspurt of religious fundamentalisms of all kind. This is an attempt to solve that problem. And that's what makes some of them so eerily metamodern, <laughs> right, is that there's like this in that conspirituality or whatever the term is there is like a moment of truth which is this resolution of the cul-de-sac or dead end of extreme modernist slash postmodernist kind of fragmented universe story nihilism where the person makes no sense maybe the person isn't even responsible for their actions because they don't have free will uh, which is interesting so you don't want to punish them because they don't have free will fair enough but therefore you shouldn't be rewarded either if you don't have free will, which means if you're holding a position of, I believe that you shouldn't be compensated more than anyone else for the books that you write, um, which you could do. You can't stop the prison system <laughs> from putting people in jail. Uh, but if you believe you don't have free will yourself, then why would you be compensated for the writing you do at a higher rate than any other person basically you see and you could you could impose that ethical limitation on yourself if you wanted to maybe because they read. can't help paying me more so uh you could you could but the point is that now we're in the really weird awkward counterintuitive language game forced upon us by reductive way of thinking about human behavior um so so yeah i think we're we're definitely in the spot of a broad multi-institutional educational crisis <laughs> which includes that meaning crisis um i've got one more question but i'm going to wait until the end of the the q a because i think it might be a good place to end on so i'm gonna ask danny mulhern if you would like to unmute yourself and ask your first question Thanks, David. Hi, Zach. Thanks very much for this. Um, yeah, my question is, if you had a nine-year-old preparing um, for secondary education at this time, what kind of schooling would you be considering? Uh, <laughs> it would depend on so many factors. It would depend on where you live. It would depend on the nature of the nine-year-old, um, how much money you have, uh, a whole bunch of things. So it's very hard to give general advice. Um, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, in Vermont, if I have a nine-year-old, <laughs> and I don't, if I was living in Vermont, um, I would likely be uh, involved with unschooling and homeschooling networks. So 
um, you know, one of the premises of my book is basically that the form of school as we know it is kind of ending. It's kind of like a little bit of a dinosaur uh, that's being out uh, outpaced. So mostly when people ask me, where should I send my kid to school? I say, if you can, if you can, don't. <laughs> Uh, and, and most people were forced into that situation during the pandemic, frankly, um, where they were forced to homeschool, uh, whether the school provided curriculum or not. <laughs> if the kid's there and an adult is there and education is happening, there's something, there's, there's, a, there's an implicit teacherly authority just in, by being a parent. Um, and that's one of the places, thank God, where teacherly authority still remains, <laughs> parent-child relationship, which is why it's one of the places where education can really take place. Um, so in general, schools, uh, with few exceptions, are part of that zero-sum competitive game for access to college, which is part of the zero-sum competitive game for access to work, which is part of that same dog-eat-dog -dog thing for access to money. <clears throat> and so uh, the schools that opt out of that are the alternative schools. Um, often will <laughs> will prepare their kids and they'll create these beautiful souls. Uh, and then they'll be completely unprepared to actually go into the world. Um, and they'll be traumatized immediately, immediately when they get to college. Um, and, uh, or they'll just train and they'll go back to be a teacher in one of those schools, <laughs> uh, which is what happens in Waldorf and, and Montessori and things of that nature, which is, which are, these are beautiful schools. I'm saying they're beautiful schools in a social context that can't contain the children, that the beautiful children that they produce because, because it's, it's because it's hard out there. Um, and it's hard out there regardless of where you go to school. So disentangling the educational experience and the conception of learning from that zero sum competition for access to scarce acclaiming resources, getting the kid to love learning for its own sake, uh, getting the kid to experience legitimate teacherly authority and the power and the love that can occur in real teacher student relationships, uh, to learn about themselves as a learner, uh, things of that nature that's what needs to be gotten regardless of where they go. So that's more like the generalized advice. Um, there isn't any particular chain of charter school or any particular region of the country or any particular approach that I've seen to schooling <laughs> that can really solve the problems and the dilemmas that children are placed in when they're put in school today between worlds. Uh, should being put in an institution from the past <laughs> and you leave that institution in the future, basically. So it's like, and there's a profound disconnect there, which we've, we've been aware of this for a while, many reflective educators. So yeah, so the answer is, I believe William, uh, I think it was Hunter S. Thompson said, when the going gets weird, the weird turn pro. Um, so there's a sense of needing to realize that the power is being sent out to the periphery as civilization breaks down, you get power sent out into the periphery, into the wilderness, where you create mystery schools, right, outside of the civilization. So these are the contexts that I think are the ones that will produce the adaptive humans that we'll need for the coming, you know, century. Thank you. Is, is this a situation that you're in at the moment, Danny? It is. It's it's preoccupying a huge amount of my time, and and I would be there in an instant if if you know it wasn't for work, and also um, the co the social costs as well. We've got an only child, so bringing someone out of school who barely gets any social and has had barely any over the last year as well, mm -hmm. that's a huge price. And I I guess it's another opportunity for collective intelligence if you've got other people homeschooling, pooling. Exactly. That's the idea. The un, it's the, un, the unschooling of the homeschooling communities, which are, um, and again, unschooling is different from homeschooling. Unschooling being uh, quite remarkable, usually per parent collectives, um, where you create social contexts that can give that social opportunity. And, and social contexts that can give unique opportunities you wouldn't get in school, like multi age groupings. <laughs> like schools are weird, right? All the kids are exactly the same age. They actually don't get to hang out with kids older than them, which means 17 year olds, unless they go to some special program, don't get to teach younger kids, which was part of the one room schoolhouse <laughs> and part of intergenerational transmission in families for, for years. So there's so many things that open up when you get out of that weird, modern factory style schooling model. Uh, 
And so some of that's happening in unschooling. But to your point about the jobs non trivial, I suggest in my book, These Social Miracles, where we give basic income guarantees and other social uh, guarantees that allow parents to actually take on responsibility for their children's education instead of giving it over to experts who are supposed to know what to do with their, their kids. So relocalization into the community and the family needs to be supported by broader social programs that recognize that things are shifting profoundly and the needs of children are shifting and the requirements of intergenerational transmission are greater now than they've ever been. It's more complex to raise a kid now. You need more time and energy to be able to do so, <laughs> not less. <laughs> and uh, so those kinds of recognitions that educational reforms are actually about social policies that surround families and schools not social policies about families and schools, if that makes sense. You fix the schools by fixing neighborhoods and uh, economic systems and apprenticeship systems and family systems, <laughs> then the school is not the problem anymore, you know? Um, so yeah, so that's maybe not a very useful answer, but uh, you know, best of luck to you and your, and your child. Thank you, much appreciated. As I feared, but appreciated. <laughs> awesome, uh, so my time. I think your question is the next most popular. Yeah, thank you, David. And uh, thank you, Zach, for being here. Um, I'm uh, at the moment halfway through your book. So um, uh, which of the 13 social miracles you talk about in your latest book do you think has the most chance of manifesting in a reality on a large scale? Uh, why do you think this and how do you know or measure this? So I think the basic income guarantee and the debt forgiveness or debt jubilee, I think these things are pretty likely in some form on a large scale in the near future. Um, this is another one of the trends that was already in the making that the pandemic accelerated and made essentially necessary. What I say about that, what I'll say is that, you know, the 13 social miracles form a gestalt Right. If you, impl if you implement one or two of them without the others, <laughs> you can actually make things worse. So even though I see a basic income guarantee in some forms as a potentially good thing, uh, rolling it out in isolation under certain conditions could be a nightmare scenario. But I, but I do see that these things are coming. They seem, seem almost inevitable. Um, and it would be easy to measure because they would be, you know, government programs, legal programs. Even to, uh, you know, large, uh, large business, large business interests are thinking about um, offering basic incomes to, you know, city scale experiments and basic income guarantees. And uh, so, yeah, so I think that would be my answer. Those are the most likely ones, the, the ones that I see as, as coming as imminent. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the, the pandemic has sort of uh, pushed those uh, forward, at least in the U.S. and with Andrew Yang talking about that uh, at, as his uh, as his uh, presidential uh, uh, platform uh, that that helped as well. I think uh, right. UBI. Yeah, well, yeah, and the AI automation yeah. uh, job, you know, job issue <laughs> that humans are becoming increasingly obsolete at many jobs because of artificial intelligence, which which I discuss in, in the book in in that context. Um, so yeah, so I see that as as coming down the pipe and we need to prepare educationally for that 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 itself creates an educational crisis right you could do that and give everyone virtual reality headsets <laughs> and just create a society no one would really want to live in uh who was reflective and interested in being in an open society uh, so without the educational accoutrements unlike the robust learning hub network i recommend in the book then the basic income guarantee without those educational affordances um, it, you know, basically it could be, again, making the situation worse, but it is happening. It's coming. Yeah, more dystopian than utopian. Thank you very much. Yeah. Awesome. So, Clay, your your question is next, but popular, but I think you're you're talking yourself out of asking it. Um, I could still ask it. Hey, Zach, good to be with you. Um, yeah, you said so much about education that I was thinking about already. Um, my question is basically, I think, you know, in these mystery schools that you've invented in uh, just today, maybe, 
what's happening in there that's different? What's missing from our current education that's happening in these mystery schools that makes us like beautiful souls in the future, also able to actually be in the world? Do you understand what I'm asking? I think so, yeah. I mean, okay, cool. and so this gets, this is what's so interesting where you see education as an aspect of civilizational uh, dynamic civilizational decline. And, and this is one of the things you, you saw, and I mentioned this time period after the end of the long 16th century, the 30 years war, when the feudal empires ended, the divine right of kings <laughs> ended and you get the Royal Society and you get the, the democratic revolution, the enlightenment. And that period was a period of, of course, tremendous sociological unrest, but it was also the, a period of, of secret societies and mystery schools and education innovation at a scale that was unprecedented, beginning with my buddy, John Amos Comenius, who I won't get into here, you know, I won't get into him here now, but so one of the characteristics of those quote mystery schools, and you see them in other aspects of civilizational collapse in other contexts, the same thing occurs, um, where there's like a, a um, sifting or culling function of what was available in the civilization that was collapsing. So you could imagine kind of the barbarians raiding the center of the civilization. They're barbarians because they're on the outside, <laughs> right? But, you know, they're the ones who are going to build the next civilization. In fact, based on the things they steal and pick up from the civilization, that is kind of, that is going down. So the they are usually more synthetic, more integrative, less biased than the civilizations they're on the outskirts of. They take the warring elements and synthesize them into something new, usually a cultural artifact. They bring higher order synthesis of the different forms of knowledge creation. This was Comenius's play with the Invisible College, which led to the Royal Society in 1660 something, uh, where he was arguing for a pan-sophic view, which would integrate science with religion and specifically put a place for natural science in the future of any governance system, which eventually occurred. Um, but that was like a crazy higher order integrative move <laughs> between warring camps that could only occur in the quote invisible college on the outskirts of a civilization that was basically in decay. So the move of those places is to be more synthetic, more integrative. Um, specifically in our context, it's going to be the reintegration of things like the sacred um, and the reorientation around um, place uh, and uniqueness and a few other things that were basically uh, where we're pointing towards the reasons why the civilization we're on the outskirts of is collapsing, why the mystery school is necessary. So you both take what's needed and you jettison <laughs> uh, and then you probably re-remember um, uh, quite a few dynamics of of what was bestowed, essentially, if that makes sense. I'm getting quite abstract now, but yeah, so it's an interesting question, theoretically. So it's it's that it's that dynamic of, and I talk about it in my book in terms of thought experiment of, uh, of the nuos arc, N-O-U-S arc, right? Like Noah's arc, it's a, it's a pun, but the nuos arc is like the arc of the mind, right? Like what would you put, if civilization was collapsing, what would you put in the nuos arc? What would be the basic ingredients, the basic seed crystals for the future? Like, given that this civilization is failing, you can't pass on the whole thing, right? Because it broke. <laughs> so you have to figure out what what's worth passing along. Uh, and it's a basic problem in the philosophy of education. And now, it's, it's this is actually one of the things that complicates teacherly authority because it's not just that the kids don't want to learn. That happens. It's also that the elders feel that they're a, they're a failed being. The elder feels they actually have nothing to teach, right? Um, so the mystery school figures out, and that those those uh, you know those people who are working on that, that those elements they figure out what what is worth passing along, you know what, and what would be viable as you know generator functions, design principles, seed crystals, whatever you want to call it, the base code, deep code of that future, <laughs> of that future, that's an educational issue. And so, yeah, there's a couple of places where I try to raise it and it's, and it's deep. Um, it's a deep, uh, basically an ethical, ultimately an ethical question. Thank you. What a great answer to this sort of small seeming question at first. <laughs> Thank you so much. In a second, we're going to come to Zach's question. But just before that, because 
Lisa, I liked your question. It brought it uh, down to a sort of very practical level. So I wonder if you might want to ask that. Yeah, maybe a, maybe there's a bridge, Zach, from the barbarian strategy back to uh, you touched on McLuhan and semantics of how do we reframe the present moment and the, the um, polysemy that we're struggling with. So my question is, have you heard the phrase learning gap being used in the K through 12 space to describe supposed lost learning during the time of the pandemic? And I wonder how might we reframe the present moment as an opportunity to learn from the COVID cohort? And maybe that's a through line to um, uh, unschooling. And what do we do when the, when the learning is hiding in plain sight, but we don't recognize it as learning? <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, the skills gap or a lost year or skill regression. There's a few phrases that are being used to describe some of the most negative consequences of the disruption of the large public school systems during the pandemic. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, it's important not to get into one narrative on that, because what you actually have is, a, like I said, a, an increasing stratification um, so that you had some kids who actually benefited <laughs> uh, from the situation and some kids who, especially in certain enclaves culturally and economically, uh, whose lives were not as severely disrupted um, and other kids in contexts where actually school was a safe place for them <laughs> and being at home was, was actually potentially dangerous. Um, so there's a wide, wide range of experience of what happened, more wide than if everyone was going to school. That's the point of school. <laughs> everyone goes to school so you can actually say kids are basically having roughly the same experience. And we make sure they're actually having a good, equal, fair experience. But when you send them all home, you know, some kids got the extra room to study in. Some kids got to study at the kitchen table with his brother who's also studying. Right. Some kids always got a parent with the TV on. Some kids' parents are reading books all the time. Uh, so there's this wide diversity but what you, of experience in what went down, but you are generally seeing that and it has happened. Um, so the reframe is just that, uh, you know, as the, the one that I tried to make in that paper and the one I tried to make in my, in my book, the reframe is that the, yeah, the disruption of the old system is precisely the opportunity and the need to build the new one that the that the now the crisis is clear like i was talking about educational crises for a while actually and now it's clear we're in one like now people are worried about the kids like they're worried about will they have the skills to succeed in the future will, can they handle how complex the world has become right can they handle like now we're worrying about them in a way we had the schools working quote unquote and we kind of <laughs> made it we weren't as worried when in fact there had been an adolescent mental health crisis in the works for for, for de a decade at least. So that, I think that's one way to reframe it is like, yeah, wake up, <laughs> you know? Like it's, it's an opportunity to really uh, invest in education uh, fundamentally, you know, as fundamentally as any other infrastructure project, um, maybe even more fundamentally. And uh, so that would be, I think the reframe, but we have to admit the loss, but we also have to admit the fragmentation and the stratification and the fact that while some kids lost a year, some kids didn't. And some kids actually got ahead. <laughs> uh, just like when some people got poor or most people, some people didn't. <laughs> some people got a lot wealthier as a result of the conditions of the pandemic. So when we tell the story about the failing educational system, we have to also shine some light on the fact that those, it's still a zero sum competitive game for access to scarce educational resources and eventually scarce economic resources. Those kids who didn't fall behind <laughs> are now potentially running ahead. So you have the skill gap leading to some kind of, some segment of the generation being kind of like left behind in this race. And that's where you get to the basic income guarantees and uh, all of that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, so I think the reframe has to be that. It has to be, you know, a wake up call and uh, one specifically about education, one specifically about potential failures of intergenerational transmission uh, and the reclaiming somehow through that broad social investment of time, energy, capital towards the education problem, which is one of those things consilience is trying to shine a light on because it ain't just the schools. <laughs> it's the fact that when they weren't in school, they were staring at this machine that was trying to addict them and, <laughs> and reap their attention for profit. <laughs> like,
So there's a whole bunch of sectors and policies that ostensibly have nothing to do with quote education reform, which were they reformed would have sweeping changes for the mental state of the youth and the possibility of intergenerational transmission. So. Mm, thank you. Awesome. So Zach McKinney. I have a question regarding the role of established institutions and systems in the transition to uh, this next world. Uh, I think we've all recognized, and thank you for helping us to do so, the systemic flaws and certainly the asymmetric power structures that are entrenched in these institutions. Um, so in that paper, in what context and where does it make sense to try and influence or infiltrate uh, institutions versus leaving with law cause, abandoning ship and working on radical alternatives. Yeah, so I didn't, you were garbled there, but the question as written, it has to do with the role of existing institution, legacy institutions, given that they're flawed, given how much change there needs to be, um, what, you know, what is, what is possible for them. Uh, and I mean, it's an important question and it's a strategic question for many people who are uh, deeply invested time, energy, emotion, or livelihoods in institutions that could be easily argued to be part of the problem, right? And so there's always been this question of, can you go in the inside, infiltrate it, <laughs> and somehow flip it and turn it to good, right? This is the notion. And I would say that that strategy can succeed. In what institutions? I don't know. <laughs> but definitely try it. <laughs> but my sense is that there are um, uh, there are such deep structural reboots needed across such basic institutions that many of the things we're going to preserve will be at a much lower level of organizational capacity. So like this is about, again, the dinner table, right? And it's about some of the much more simple contexts, which we could call institutions and legacy institutions, <laughs> uh, which would need to be preserved um, in the context of the transition. Um, so in a sense, we're looking at a situation of like uh, rescuing and again, like re-remembering re <laughs> the core of the human experience that needs to be preserved as massive technological infrastructures change kind of behind our backs and over our heads, um, reconstituting the life world and communication flows and commodity flows and a whole bunch of things in ways. When you look at the spatial web and you look at web 3.0 and all of that kind of stuff, like it's, a, it's, it's very, very different. Um, and so, so yeah, so in that sense, when I, I'm actually kind of flipping your question and saying, yeah, it's about, it's not about these institutions you think of, like the schools or the media or these kinds of things. It's actually about much more basic social institutions, which we need to find a way to preserve in the context of the, of the transformation. Um, and I mentioned some of them like religion and, and the family, uh, but there are others um, as well that, that fit into that basic category. Um, I mentioned the open society, for example, the notion of the open society, um, deliberative democracy, things of that nature are in a position to be eliminated as viable options and argued away. <laughs> um, you know, why have an open society if there isn't free will? What is, what are you choosing um, to choose? Um, so, so yeah, so in that sense, I'm, I'm looking at it, that deeper strata and quite concerned about uh, the, the kind of whitewashing and trying to put some stuff on that new OS arc that just shouldn't be, <laughs> that just shouldn't be on the arc if you're, if you're following. Awesome. So we're coming into the last five minutes. So we've already got time for maybe one or two more questions. And because it amuses me, um, we're going to go from Zach answering Zach's question and Zach Parsons, would you like to ask your question next? Yeah, sure. This this is the Zach attack that we had dreamed of, um, and and Z A K. I, I hear you use the word remember, you know, all the time, and and of course our name is of Hebrew origin, which means God has remembered. Um, how much does that come up in your um, exploration of everything that you do? Just the sort of namesake that you were you were given. That's a very interesting question. 
uh, it was, it wasn't until quite later in life that I actually explored that, you know, I wasn't raised religious. Um, although, you know, the patriarchal line is through to, to Jewish, uh, roots in Yugoslavia, but yeah, so there's a sense in which, uh, I had discovered my interest in, in religion and psychology before I discovered that my namesake was to, to remember God basically. <laughs> uh, and so, so that's interesting, but yeah. And, you know, my orientation has been since I was in my twenties. Um, and, and at that time, mostly interested in religious studies and religious practice, um, to be, to be doing something that was not in the modern paradigm in that respect. This is one of the reasons I gravitated to Wilbur and to Bascar, <laughs> uh, that I was trying to do a form of post-secular theorizing essentially, which would be to ask everyone to remember God, <laughs> uh, that we thought that we could just run this thing uh, and just increase secularization endlessly. This was the sociological hypothesis of Weber and others, um, but it turned out they were wrong. And Charles Taylor eventually coined that term, you know, the post-secular age. And so, yeah, around the same time, I realized that my namesake was was as religious as it was. <laughs> I, uh, I had already committed to that to that form of social theorizing, which was, which was post secular and, um, yeah. And to those forms of practices, which would allow me to remember God <laughs> and eventually taking up, uh, Hebrew <laughs> and, uh, Kabbalah and, and things of that nature after practicing Zen for many years. Beautiful. Amazing. Well, I, I squandered my question on a, on a selfish one, but, uh, I, I appreciate the response. Awesome. I wonder whether you might want to ask your questions, Zach, because I do think it's a really nice place to end. Um, oh, maybe I didn't squander it then. Thanks, David. Yeah. So mine was really about, um, you mentioned the word citizen capacity and, and so many of the terms that you brought up, I'm like thinking, man, I need to read this guy's book. Um, so uh, how much does citizen capacity align with geography or, or ask another way, how much of our citizen capacity is necessarily focused on our local community? Hmm. Totally. So it's very interesting. So, I mean, in my book, I argue for a kind of um, like a, a bioregional, a bioregionalism nested in the cosmopolitanism. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm saying that the, that the, the, the citizen capacities are both universalistic in the sense of like the future citizen capacities are those of a, member of the human species on the planet earth. <laughs> uh, that's the trajectory of this thing. It's not a globalist conspiracy. It's a Tilliard Deschardins evolutionary inevitability. Uh, so the, the, those skills are interesting, the universal ones, but they're without teeth and without substance. If the person isn't embodied in a bioregional location, not necessarily a nation state, but a bioregional location where there are specific things that can happen that they can't happen. <laughs> and that puts specific demands on communities and governance structures and the, the kinds of decisions that need to be made and the schools that are in place and things of that nature. You know, the distributed hub network is intended to basically localize education at the level of the community and have kids focusing on community problems in that community and working with apprentice relationships in that community. But the hub is infused with connections through the digital to, to the universal and can talk with any other hub and can hold the cosmopolitan dispositions that are necessary while also being rooted in the local needs of the community, right? And if it turns out that a kid's coming up in that local educational hub, with the cosmopolitan sensibility is looking around with the local needs and he's like, I don't want to fit into this locale. <laughs> then we can send them someplace else, right? And, uh, and vice versa. So the idea that the bioregionalism creates a sector specific educational niche uh, and sector specific kind of governance demands for the local citizenry. It's just more complex to live in some places. Um, so, so that's the way I'm kind of I'm holding it. It's kind of a, a, co a local cosmopolitanism, I think even more specific than local bioregional. And so I talk about one of the 13 miracles having to do with uh, geography and the land and the nature of these 
borders that we've drawn, <laughs> like which are, are political fictions. They have political history. They're there for a reason, but they're not part of the earth itself. Bioregions <laughs> are arguably much more part of the earth itself, the Mississippi, Mississippi River Valley, um, the here uh, between Connecticut and Vermont, down through Massachusetts and Connecticut, the Connecticut River Valley, the Pioneer Valley, divided by all of these states, <laughs> all of these problems doing business across state lines in those areas, when bioregionally it could be integrated. It's an idea Mumford had. So, yeah, so it's not just, uh, it's not just the, um, the local, it's I think more specific, it's the bioregional. And then the, the million dollar question is what are those universal, uh, universal human kind of capacities? Like, like when you're thinking about what the UN has been trying to do <laughs> and, and not doing successfully for a very long time of bringing to the world a basic set of capacities of citizenship. I think about Martha Nussbaum's work with Amitri Sen about the capacities approach in India and the third world, where the focus wasn't on just distributing resources, it was about capacitating people to the requisite level of skill. Um, so it's like, don't just give women in these countries money. You give them money, they're still in the situation they were in, now they have a little bit of money. <laughs> like you actually need to change social structure and educate them into a position of being able to take the money responsibly. Um, so that notion of the, what is that baseline set of civic capacities that needs to be universally distributed as just like a undeniable social good. And then what are those bioregionally specific skills that need to be distributed in that area by virtue of the community history, cultural history, ge geography, et cetera. So that's kind of the way I'm, I'm holding that. So we are at time and we're just about to shift to the after hours, but I just wanted to ask you, Zach, before just to close about your personal dispensation, like you, you're wrestling with these sort of really deep questions, civilizational questions. Are you an optimist, a pessimist, or do you veer between the two? How, how, what's your personal dispensation towards the meta crisis and the aspects of it that you're dealing with? Uh... I think there's some phrase where you say that you're a theoretical pessimist, but a practical optimist. And so there's a bunch of ways to kind of try to split the difference there. Um, I honestly am optimistic about humans, uh, but very cautious about technology. And so in that sense, I believe that almost no matter what happens, humans will be okay in the sense that we will be able to die dignified deaths, for example. We will be able to make meaning. Um, so even if this thing ends poorly, you can save your soul, right? Like, and I say this in a couple of places in that paper, you know, there's a way that the opportunity here is actually to step into, <laughs> to step into the, the task of dying um, and to step into the task of collapse. And this sounds like I'm a pessimist, but what I'm saying is that actually the opportunity here is to do the right thing when it really matters. And so I believe in humans' ability to do that, which is to say, um, this is going to be an opportunity for actual heroism <laughs> and, and villain and villains, <laughs> right? But like, this is the, uh, I, I always quote Orbindo, you know, he said in the final push towards planetization, there'll be a race between heaven and hell, right? Um, Sri Aurobindo, the great Indian revolutionary and, and mystic and sage. Um, and what he's talking about there is this moment, right? This moment of liminality uh, when what you need to have is a kind of humane and humble optimism in the human adaptive capacity, um, as opposed to a specific techno-optimism right a specific form of solution it's not that that's in the omniscient only you need to have the transcendent and the imminent experience of what is possible and that ends up returning to i'll say the dinner table again these concrete contexts in which we do our soul making and our ability to make the right choices in those contexts that's the difference between the life that's well spent and not well spent and so i believe people can still even under conditions of collapse have lives that are well spent 
And so that's the success of the human. Um, now we need to stop civilizational collapse and, and avert existential risk. But if we do that and we lose our souls, then what's the point, right? Um, so in that sense, I'm optimistic that the human uh, will, will preserve itself. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm concerned, you know, um, concerned as well about what the specifics are going to look like in the coming years. So. Awesome. Zach, thank you so much for making the time. This was a fantastic session. And in a second, Clay is going to play some music to, to mark the transition to the after hours. And then the after hours will begin after that tune. But as we traditionally do, if everyone would like to unmute themselves and we'll say thank you to, to Zach. I'm sure we'll see you again at some time soon, Zach, but thank you so much. Thank you very Thanks, much. Zach. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you, Zach. Thank you, Zach, thank for you. remembering God. Thank you, Zach. Thanks a lot. The film you just watched was a conversation that happened in Rebel Wisdom's digital campfire. So to join conversations like this, to submit questions, stay for the after hours hangout to talk about the ideas in the films, and to practice and develop some of the skills we talk about on the channel, check out the membership options. There's three different levels of membership. Sensemakers get to join our regular Sensemaker showcase events with some of the most interesting thinkers around. And also the monthly Wisdom Gym sessions where we speak to and also have a chance to work with some of the world's best teachers and facilitators. Explorers can join the Rebel Wisdom Book Club sessions, the monthly Philosophical Journey sessions, and also the regular Skills Academy to practice skills like mindfulness, sovereignty, and sense-making. And from now on, all members get to join our monthly AMA sessions with us, where you can ask any questions about anything to do with Rebel Wisdom.